Uh, we always end our after our morning session with an economic outlook and update, and so we've got Dr. Glenn Tonzer with our Ag Econ Department here to do that. And so, as many of you have had, I think you're all. Uh, it, we're on an exciting ride, and he's going to take us on it here for the next 35 or 40 minutes, and hopefully have a few uh, opportunity for a few questions, as I'm sure there will be. So, very good. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Jason, I very much enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm confident not everybody likes every point you shared, but I very much appreciate you coming to provide it. I think it was very good. Um, and before I go through my slides, I'm going to add a comment. Um, and I don't normally do this, but I think it's a useful segue between talks. Uh, some of you know I grew up on a hog farm. Uh, some of you may have been at a Swine Profitability Conference a few weeks ago. And one of the charts I shared in that talk was some information from Iowa State University in the hog sector. And in 2021, 2022, there's an estimate out there that for each market hog that came from a farrow to finish operation in Iowa, there was 10 to $12 per head of manure credit. No, think through what I just said, 10 to $12 per head per market hog in Iowa last two years because fertilizer prices were high, right? So the value of that manure was a lot higher when fertilizer prices was higher. I'm giving you that example because I'm 42. I grew up on a hog farm in Missouri. When I was a little kiddo, we never thought about manure as a valuable. I mean, it was 100% waste, right? And more generally, the whole industry, not just my operation. That's an example of things that have changed. Now, please don't take my comment to say it's going to be worth 10 bucks the next three years. I mean, as fertilizer prices come down and so forth, that number will change. But the notion of manure coming from a hog farm not always being a waste, and by the way, it not being worth the same to all hog farmers and so forth as a function of corn farms around you, and lots of things go into that is different than it once was. So manure is a lot less controversial than greenhouse gases is why I use it, but there's real economic value to that today in Iowa and more generally throughout the hog system. Um, things change is the point. So I encourage you to take a lot of the information Jason shared to heart. Whether we like it or not, things change, and at times the economic signals around us change. So that's my only segue comment, but I did enjoy your presentation. Most of you know my slides are going to be posted, they are posted. Uh, Rich Llewellyn over in the Ag Econ Department got them posted about an hour ago. Um, our agmanager.info website is where you'll find those. There's a contributors tab, and then in alphabetical order, all the economists like me that post have a page there. You can find these slides there. Uh, I tell everybody that because you're welcome to write down as much as you want, but it's all there, so I'm not hiding anything from you if I go fast on a few slides. I like to bookend an Outlook talk, give you a big picture summary, a lot of details in the middle, and then I'll try to summarize again at the end. My take home summary points here would be separate supply and demand just to keep it simple. On the supply side, we continue to have evolution that is supportive of cattle prices. That's a nice way of saying we're shrinking the herd, fewer animals go in the system, fewer hooves on balance means fewer beef pounds. So pull down the supply, if demand holds its own, that's gonna push cattle prices, whether we're talking fed, yearling, or calves, higher over the next two years. We also have to take note, I just embedded if demand holds its own in that statement. Um, the narrative around beef demand, both here at home as well as foreign demand for US beef, so the export channel, has changed in the last six months. Uh, throughout the pandemic, and if I say the pandemic, I think March of 2020, kind of the start, if you hear me use the term pandemic, that's what's in my mind. Uh, throughout the pandemic until about the third quarter of 2022, we were pleasantly surprised by how strong domestic beef demand was, but certainly by the time we got to the fourth quarter of 2022, that narrative was changing, and I'm gonna come in depth with that at the end, but we ended 2022 with domestic beef demand slipping, and we've started 2023 with beef demand slipping. So that's gonna push back on the supply side support is the point of that comment. So if demand slips a little, which is not a scientific term, but think about just a little bit of slippage, the supply side is going to trump that, no pun intended, that's not a political comment, is prices will go higher, okay? If demand slips a lot, that may well be a bigger deal than the supply side. So just because we're shrinking the number of hooves does not guarantee higher cattle prices if beef demand really fell. Now, I'm not expecting it to really fall, but it is my job to remind you if there's some bigger macroeconomic problem where people's willingness to pay for beef falls quite a bit, that can more than offset the supply side support. On balance, I think we have bullish cattle prices ahead of us in the next two years, but the biggest risk is on the demand side, is the point of that. Now the next two slides are probably the ugliest ones I'm gonna give you. That's why I tell you that you can pull all this up later if you want. Uh, I bring these from LMIC, and again, whenever I'm in the Animal Science and Industry Department, I remind us this is a different LMIC. Uh, Livestock Marketing Information Center is this acronym. It's a group based in Denver, 
many land-grant universities like K-State and a whole bunch of USD agencies and so forth are members of that group. They pull together tons of information, and then I bring it to you the best I can in these kind of talks. What you have up here on this slide is basically the, the herd. So we have commercial slaughter, followed by dressed weights, followed by the net of that, which is beef production, right? Hooves times pounds gives us pounds. Think of it that way. And we have calendar year 2022 by quarter, and then the yellow rows are for the year. So we have 22 followed by 2023, 20, which obviously are projections, and then out to 2024. The punchline is told by the arrow, which is to your all's right over here is all down. Throughout 2023, and certainly starting the second quarter all the way through 2024, we're gonna have a lot fewer animals harvested, right? So remember, this starts with commercial slaughter. The number that's up here, say for the second quarter of 23, is 4.4% lower commercial slaughter than we had the second quarter of 2022. For the calendar year of 23, a 4% reduction compared to 2022, and then even more so and fairly extreme, looking out to 2024, maybe 7.5% further reduction, right? That's a reduction compared to 2023. This is a result of fewer mama cows in the system, just biologically what happens thereafter. In the middle is the dressed weights, average by quarter. Basically no major change is projected. Small decline here, maybe 23, maybe an increase in 2024. Uh, the reason there's an almost 1% increase forecast in 2024 is maybe feed grains get a little bit cheaper. Maybe with fewer animals, there's a market signal to pump more pounds on each animal because they're gonna be in the yard a little bit differently and so forth. But on balance, that's a small number compared to 7.5% decline on hooves. So the far right is the real story. Maybe 4.5% less beef's gonna be hitting or being produced here in the US in 2023 compared to last year, and maybe 6.5% to 7% further reduction in 2024. So that's a lot of geeky numbers behind my comment, supply side support for cattle prices. That's what I'm talking about. So what about the actual prices? This is set up the same way. Now we have the five market fed cattle prices first, and the Southern Plains yearling and calves. I'll just jump to a couple examples. The arrow's up, of course, as I've given that away here. But here for the second quarter, LMIC has a projection of 158 to 162 on here. This is a one month old slide. If I was to update that today, I'd say it's closer to 164, 165, okay? If you look at the board and basis adjust and so forth. So upper 150s to the mid 160s with Glenn swag to these numbers as we go through the second quarter of 2023. Let's just pick calves for convenience here. If we go out here to the end of 2023, the numbers there range from 208 to 230. I'm gonna give you a number in a minute that's a 240. That's a more recent basis adjusted futures price. So calves are well above two bucks in all these projections. And you quickly get, I think 240 is the number I'm gonna give you in a few slides. But a $2 calf doesn't get you as excited as a $2 calf 10 years ago did because the cost of raising that calf is nowhere near like it was 10 years ago, right? So these are, out, these are just output prices, but they are definitely increasing. They're projected to increase in 2023. We look out to 2024, 165 to 175 fed cattle is with the number that's up here. Look out the fourth quarter, say for calves, 243 to 258 is the number that's up here. So higher cattle prices on balance, primarily dictated by supply side support. All right, most of you probably know that every January, USD puts out the cattle inventory report. Uh, geeks like me wait for that and do a deep dive. There's a lot of state level information in it. Um, it's our best pulse of how many cows are in the system, how many heifers have been held back, and we get state level insights, not just the whole country. But it also gives us some insight at the moment of how much have we pulled down the national herd. Because I've kind of set that tone here and I think we're all aware of that. Well, the number that came out, which is the first one on this chart, is we started the year, so January 23, with 28.9 million beef cows in the US, which basically was the same as what we had in 2014. It was barely under, so there's comments out there about a 60 year low, which is technically true, but I mean, it was rounding error basically the same as 2014. We've had this typical cattle cycle. Now there's been a lot of things in our society that has not been typical during that, but regardless, we had this low in 2014, which corresponded with very high cattle prices, we all remember, that triggered expansion, we peaked here in 2019 and we've been declining, okay? For historical context going further back, in 2004, we had a small bottom in the cattle cycle, if you like, because it was a little bit of uptick after that, 32.5 million cows, and go further back, kind of a peak in one of the earlier cycles, was 1996, was 35.3 million. So there's fewer cows in the system. Downward trend is long-term, and you, if I plotted this back to the 70s, you'd see it's long-term as well, but that doesn't mean we're producing less beef. This is beef cows, right? Remember, we're getting a lot of more beef out of each mama cow that's in the system, and that has to be kept in mind on where we're going forward. 
I made the comment that cattle inventory report has a lot in it. State level numbers are one of them. This is a picture of all that information, again, starting this calendar year. Kansas, it's estimated, had 1.3 million beef cows to start this year. Some of you are rolling your eyes because you have context about what that is compared to the past. That's 106,000 head than the year before. So again, this is done each January. Most of these states up here are pink or red, which are declines. So this is comparing January 23 versus January 2022. Again, Kansas, 106,000 fewer, fewer beef cows. Uh, Oklahoma, 140 less. Texas, 125 less. Of those three, Kansas is actually a bigger percentage decline because there's fewer mama cows, right, in Kansas compared to those two. The herd as a whole was a million cows less. I'm just giving you some geographical frame here um, of how the herd and where the herd was pulled down, and this is just a one-year change. I've kind of alluded to this one already, but I'll remind us this, and Jason actually alluded to this in a couple of his uh, responses as well. This typical cattle cycle is what I'm plotting here. There's eight different cycles that are on this ugly chart going all the way back to 1938. Most of these, historically speaking, have been eight to 12 years in duration. So we started a low, we expand the herd, we hit some kind of peak, and then we decline. At some point we hit a trough and we do it again, which Jason alluded to, and there's a lot of historical precedent to that. I hope with your visual eye, this darkest blue one is the current cycle we're on. This kind of darker dotted green one, or I don't know if it's green or brown, what are you gonna call it, it's right by it, is the one before it. The red one is the one before it, and so forth. But then you go all the way back in time, like in the late 60s and 70s, is this one. Why am I doing that to you? I'm not trying to make you sick with my laser. That's not the goal here. Is I'm trying to help you see the gap between the peak and the trough and the cycles is narrowing. This blue one is much flatter than one that was a long time ago. It's a simple way of saying that, okay? We've documented that in a fact sheet. Uh, I'm blessed to work with a lot of PhD students. One of them is in the room today, so I'm glad she came. Uh, Jamie Luke and Andrew Anderson are two I work with. Uh, actually, before them, another PhD student worked with me, summarizing the nature of these cattle cycles, but then going further and kind of a so what points are in that. I encourage you to bring this up and review it. The so what part of those cycles narrowing, the peak to trough difference narrowing, for today's discussion, in my opinion, from assessing all this, is when we pull the trigger on expansion, and we could debate when that's going to happen. I'm sure we probably will in the Q&A. I don't think we're going to add as many mama cows as a lot of people think we will. The number one reason for that is we don't need as many back in the system to hit a beef production target as we did 10 years ago or we did 30 years ago. And in my opinion, the economics of the industry start with beef production. What does the world need and want in terms of beef pounds? And then what's the most efficient way to get that? How many mama cows do we need to get there and so forth? So we won't need to add back as many. Some will be just building back a herd to where it was. If you're a 100 cow operation, you're down to 80. Like the first 20 is just building back where you were. And that's fine. I, mean, I think we're going to do a fair amount of that. But that's not the same as adding another 20 and becoming a 120 cow operation. The amount of beef we get if a lot of people do that is a lot bigger than it was in the past. And that will quickly send a signal. Calf prices will decline quicker than they used to if we do that. So I don't think we're going to go back to the old numbers, which is why I give you that long history. I can't come up with a scenario that says 34 million beef cows is a different way to say that, okay? And that may not be popular, that's okay. You guys know by now I'm not trying to be popular, I'm trying to be helpful, is there's a lot of economic reasons that I think we will expand the herd, but I don't think it'll go as high as a lot of people are anticipating. And this just reiterates that point. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on the herd expansion component because I think there's a possibility between now and when I do this next year, presume I'm invited back, um, and it's okay if I'm not, but you know, whoever gives this talk, somebody's gonna be in the process of rebuilding. I think the year after that, there'll be a lot of effort. I mean, I'm, I think it'll be very cautious and limited in the next 12 months. The females that are available is gonna constrain that. But the subsequent, so in 2024 in particular, I think it's gonna be of key interest. So I want you to be aware of these patterns. We started the year with very few beef replacement heifers in the system, that's all this chart means. And if you're in the realm of thinking about expanding your herd or just rebuilding where you were, I encourage you to make use of this resource on our Ag Manager website. So raise your hand, and I'm gonna do this to make sure everybody's still awake. If you remember Dr. Kevin Dewetter. All right, put that hand down. Now raise your other hand if you remember Kevin Dewetter. All right, we're still awake, that's good, all right. Ke Kevin was very good at his job. Several of you know him quite well. Uh, it's been several years since he's left K-State and he's with Elanco, but he was really good at building Excel-based decision tools. And this is one of them he built and I now just maintain it, but it's called KSU Beef Replacements. The whole point of this is given inputs you put in 
And we have base default situation, which I'm going to interpret in a second for you. You could tweak it for your operation, and you can calculate a net present value of adding a female to your herd. Jason gave you an example of a net present value in his talk. That's a very convenient economic measure of what's the value to your operation. He had a per acre version in his. This is a per female for your cow-calf operation version. It gives you some context of what you quote unquote can pay is the whole point of it. Now, if you choose to pay more than that, that's your personal decision, but the tool is gonna tell you you're putting in an expected rate of return that's lower than what you might have desired if you overpay. So at least use the tool to be informed when you make that decision and give you a number. I have two slides that are follow-ups on that. Using that resource is the default to the base case as of now is an annual cash cost. So think out of pocket cost. This is not total cost, but just cash to feed the cow, maintain the cow of $900 per year, an assumption of an annual inflation rate of 3%, which would not apply today, but it might over the duration of that female in your operation, a discount rate of 8%, and then USDA projected calf prices are one of the three calf price scenarios that we've built into this, and it's the conservative one, so that's the one I'm comfortable bringing to you first here. For reference, it has a 218 uh, price for 2024. I think that's pretty conservative, but regardless, that's the default that's in it. If you hit run on the default in this tool, net present value of a heifer that's gonna give you seven calves, okay? So you, your best guess is you're gonna get seven calves out of her and then send her to market is $1,346. Importantly, I bring this chart because it's also populated in this tool. How does that story change as costs on your operation change? So the default that I just talked you through was you have cash cost of $900 per year to run the cow. If your actual cash cost are 775, so if you happen to be able to run that female for 125 bucks less than our default case, that number goes up to 1824. And I know I speak fast, so I'm getting better about repeating things over time. If your costs are lower, you could pay more. Conversely, of course, if your costs are higher, so if you go this way, if it costs you over 1,000 bucks cash cost to run the cow, the value of adding a female to your herd is lower. And it's over $400 difference. So that $125 swing in annual cost has a roughly a $450 swing on the net value of that animal. And it's because it's a multi-year calculation, okay? Now, as you change your expected calf price, as you change the discount rate, as you change any of the things in this calculator, you'll move these numbers. My point here on lower cost can pay more, will hold regardless, but I do encourage you to pull up this tool, put in your own calf price expectations if you want, there's one in here that's USDA times 10 per, uh, 110%. So if you think they're 10% too conservative, you can click that one on and so forth. You'll move these bars, but please use that to make a more informed decision. Um, I believe I was here in 2012 talking about that same tool with Ted Schroeder. If you guys remember what 2012 looked like, um, I probably had more hair then, but been a few less, you know, I've had some battles since then, but Ted and I were talking through how to use that. I hope folks use that thinking through what to pay in 2014 through 2016 when we started pulling expansion. The mechanics of that tool are the same. Just please make use of it again. All right, so where are we at with actual prices? Um, there's three or four charts that are built just like this. The solid blue line is the current year, which of course is 23. The dotted line is last year, 2022. And then the preceding five-year average is this big, ugly red line. This is five to six weights or calf market for the Southern Plains. Right here, you'll see the fall of 2022, 178 and 189 are the two numbers that I have up there. More generally, 180 to 190 were pretty common calf prices people received in the fourth quarter. There were several cases of $2 calves already. I mean, that depended on exactly your weights and so forth, but we've already hit a $2 market is the point of that for some operations. And we're well on our way, I think, to do that again. But I alluded to this, the cost of producing that calf is a lot higher. So USDA information, go back to 1995 on cash cost to run a cow. I didn't put a trend line on here, but you guys can see how much it's went up over time. A couple specific numbers, particularly for those of you in the back. In 2022, USDA estimates it costs $963 cash cost. Again, this is not total cost, right? Not your fixed cost, it's just out of pocket cash cost to run a cow. That is up. 100 bucks, 103 bucks to be exact, compared to 2019. It's projected to go up not quite another 100 bucks here in 2023. So 1,045 is the projected value for 2023. So make no mistake, it takes a lot more resources to run a cow today than it used to. I like to interject a break-even number from that because it gives somebody a you know, thumb of reference. If that 1045, $1,045 cash cost applies to you in 2023, so let's just say the USD situation hits your operation 
And Glenn's going to say there's 400 bucks of additional cost, fixed cost, non-cash cost. The total cost to your operation is 1,445 in that example. If I go further and I say you get about 85% of your revenue from your calf crop and 15% from culling revenue, which is roughly, you know, there's 10 to 20 throughout the industry, so I'll use 15 to split the difference here. That implies a six weight calf break even price of 205. So if you follow the scenario I just gave you, you need 205 to break even in 2023. Now, the market's projecting above 205, but I'm trying to give frame a reference that $2 calf is the new break even. It's not the really good year number. Okay? And that's what this chart's about. So this is a return over cash cost going back to 1995. Here in 2022, LMIC estimates the typical operation at a plus $38 return per cow. They're projecting for 2023 to be 96 bucks. Let's just call it 100 bucks per cow for convenience today. And then after 2024, projecting it to be 233. The primary reason for this big jump in 2024 is fewer animals in the system, which I showed you like second, third slide. But the other one, which I'd say there's a big variance around this 2024 one particularly, is if we pull the trigger hard in 24 on expansion, we're going to pull a lot of six week calves off the market. So in 2024, there is the prospect that number goes up even more than it's here. Notice how I said that, there is the prospect. But there's a lot more uncertainty, in my opinion, on the 2024 bar than there is the 2023 one, is the reason I teed that additional point up. I'm not convinced 100 bucks projected here in 2023 is going to get the average person real excited about expanding, given all the risk involved. I do think it's big enough that if Mother Nature lets people rebuild if they're an operation that has had to deplete the herd, so if you went for 100 to 80 cows in my example earlier, that's definitely, if Mother Nature allows you, I think people will try to get back to the 100. But that's not an industry expansion per se, that's an industry rebuild argument. That's not big enough of a carrot to get new entrants or you know, major new capital investment beyond the rebuild. And it's certainly not enough given the risk involved and as a percentage of the cost involved, 100 bucks isn't as big as a number as it was when you can run a cow for 700 bucks compared to 1,000 today. Okay? I like to remind folks of this beefbasis.com resource. I mentioned Kevin Dubetter earlier. He, had, he was one of them that started this also. Uh, I helped try to maintain it. You can use this to get projected feeder cattle prices for three different markets here in Kansas. I always just bring Salina in uh, to keep my head on straight about what I'm saying in each talk. But you can also pull up Pratt and Dodge in this. If you drove here from southeast Kansas, I'd encourage you to pull up the Joplin, Missouri market. It's closer. Uh, depending where you're at, there's different corners. Actually, the Nebraska market or Missouri market, if you go far enough west, a Colorado market might actually make more sense. So you can pull up this and there's a map of all the markets. They're the biggest AMS reported markets that's populating this tool. So find the one that's closest to your operation and then do this. But for Salina, as of March 1st, a projection for this middle of October is you might be able to sell a six weight for 240 bucks. And the way this tool works, it's bringing up the nearby futures contract, the CME feeder cattle contract that's applicable for that point in time, right? Which one will be the nearby at that point in time. And then it has a bunch of historic basis the difference between the local cash and the futures market for that scenario. And this scenario depends on the market, depends on the time. It steers the way I'm quoting it, but you can do it for heifers too, and depends on the weight. So those all nudge the basis around, but you can use it, um, and I encourage you to make use of that. So the 240 is well above 205, okay? So the 205 break even, we're, gonna, we're projected to exceed that this year. But before now and then, and I'm now transitioning away from cow-calf, we have other segments of the industry, right? So background or stocker, we'll move towards feed yard. What about the summer grass market as we're getting closer to that? You can use the same resource again for Salina. What if I'm gonna either retain my own or buy somebody's 750 pounder first week in April and I'm a target Labor Day selling at 950? Now again, in this tool, you can change those dates and weights, but just to demonstrate it today, I plan to put 200 pounds on over those 154 days is the scenario I'm painting here. The market's projecting basically $2, 199 is what you're going to pay here in April, but it's a little bit above two bucks is what you expect to sell it at. Now, I've been saying this for at least six months. Not normally do we see this. Usually when you have a heavier weight animal, we expect the price to go down per hundred weight. But at the moment, there's that clinical carry if you look across the feeder cattle contracts. That's mainly because of the supply side. We think there's fewer animals under each of those contracts going forward. But the net of that is a very high historically projected value of gain. So 212 bucks per hundred weight or $425 per head. At the same time, that $400 per head 
doesn't go as far as it once did if you've got a lot more cost involved in accomplishing this, right? But this economic carrot is bigger than it once was. So be aware of that. Use this resource again to get the revenue side, the value of gain side of this enterprise. This is just a margin enterprise of putting 200 pounds on. Compare that with your own expected cost of gain to figure out if you want to do this. Figure out if you want to nudge the weights and the dates and so forth. You can use the tool to make more informed decisions. That leads me to this other decision aid, and I'm not going to walk you through it. I'm just going to remind you it's there. Again, do better built it, and I now maintain this one, is KSU feeder cattle risk management tool. Um, if you're in the business of selling feeder cattle, you can use this to compare the cash scenario or the status quo, the kind of do nothing, just take the market price, versus CME traditional futures hedge, versus buying a put option, versus buying USDA's LRP, their insurance product, and the subsidy on that has went up over time. So this tool is designed to give, basically projects how those alternative approaches would compare, and you can figure out if you want to pull the trigger on establishing price floors or price da downward price protection on your feeder cattle. That's the point of that resource, and I encourage you to make use of it. The yearling market, we're starting here. This year, obviously higher than last year. You guys know that. Uh, I made this comment earlier about the Fed market. Uh, this is dated the last week of February. 161 was the five market price. 164 would apply here as I speak today. So mid-160s is where we're at, Fed cattle market. Each month I put out this barometer, um, and it's far from perfect. I'm happy to talk through that on the, you know, I poke holes in it if we want. But Justin um, helps with this. The Animal Science and Industry Department more generally is responsible for the focus on feedlot survey. So if you happen to be somebody that completes that survey, thank you. Uh, we make use of that information for the, I'm going to call it the performance side and the animal side, specifically the placement weight, the outweight, the implied average daily gain, the death loss, those kinds of things I'm taking from that survey each month. And then I'm marrying it up with market information. So the cash market for fed cattle, the cash for feeder cattle, and the Garden City corn price are the drivers of this that I'm marrying up with all that. And I have historic returns that are before this, if you pull this up on our website, and then each month I put it out, I project for the upcoming nine months, and it's those projections that most people are most interested in. I'm just going to highlight the second column is a projected net return for steers that would leave the yard in each of these months. So for example, for March right there, that number is 9034. The way you interpret that is when I kick this out on February 9th at that time, given the scenarios that we paint out, is a steer leaving the yard in March was projected to have a $90 positive return. More generally, these are all positive projections out until October. The reason they're positive is elevated expected fed cattle prices that range, they're basically all in the 160s, right? It varies by month exactly what number they are, but 158 is in here one spot, and then you know, crowd in 170s we get towards the end. The cost of gain is still historically high, but projected to improve, which in this case is decline as we go out between now and October. Meanwhile, we're projected to be paying more for the animals coming in. So the feeder's coming in, right? This is the relation of these, okay? So at some point, unless we have some demand growth, as I keep going through this, like I don't have a November number, but a month from now I will. This keeps rolling forward. These higher and higher feeder cattle prices are going to catch up with us, and they're going to squeeze that margin. But sitting here as of today, positive expected margin for the typical person that does no hedging, that has no extra grid premiums, is what this scenario is. So it's a barometer of trends. All right, some comments about beef demand. Um, this is probably timely because we celebrated this family last night. Um, if you're into podcast, I encourage you to get subscribed or go join Matt's uh, Perrier's podcast. In November, he asked me to be on. You don't have to listen to mine. It's not the point of that plug, but more generally, I like what he's doing there. So it's practically a ranching podcast. I gave a long description of this three-legged stool in that podcast. But for today, I just want to remind us, there's three market channels for U.S. beef. There's the domestic food service, so think away from home restaurants primarily. There's domestic retail, which is primarily grocery store for at-home consumption. And then there's the foreign demand, which is export. I like the notion of a three-legged stool to remind us that all three matter. But I also like it because in the last three years, we've had sizable disruptions to where these three legs have been out of whack. And really early in the pandemic, for sure, we took out restaurants. I mean, things like stay-at-home orders effectively kill restaurant demand. So that leg right there became two inches long instead of 18 inches long or whatever example you want to use, right? We, we cut that leg off. Meanwhile, we boosted the retail demand. So we doubled the length of one leg and we cut another one off. It's no longer balanced, right? So this thing wobbles around when it's not balanced. Export demand has a similar story. We had logistical challenges early in the pandemic, but then demand grew. 
More recently, particularly the fourth quarter of 2022, I have to tell you all three channels were having challenges. Okay, so there's a time component to this, but I like the picture just to remind us, all three channels matter. We consume different beef products, or more carefully stated, we push different beef products through these channels. It's not like it's the exact same proportions of every carcass that go in all three. I always use the extreme version of tongue, but it's more complicated than that. Most of our beef tongues go in this channel, right? But more completely, we vary a lot on what beef products go through these, and they all three matter a lot. This is a chart, um, every month I put out a demand index for the foreign sector, so export demand for US beef. The way you interpret this is since 2010, the trend line is very positive. So global demand for US beef has grown a lot since January of 2010 is the base period on here. And there's a lot of hiccups of seasonal variation. This one bounces around, but we've had a lot of decline in the last six months. So more recently, I have to say the foreign demand for US beef has slipped. Now, I think that has a lot to do with Historically high dollar, it makes it, our beef is less affordable on the global market when our dollar is higher. And a lot of global macroeconomic headwinds, so a lot of economies are not growing at the clip they were before. The China zero COVID thing going on longer than we expected and so forth had a lot bigger, broader global macroeconomic implications. So the ability and interest of foreign consumers of buying U.S. beef, it got more expensive and they weren't as willing to do it if their own economy wasn't as strong, okay? I hope that turns back. I've included some points here in February in several years. We tend to see a decline or kind of a bottom in the December through February period on export demand. I'm highlighting that because if there's a seasonal pattern, maybe we'll get a boost soon to come back on this chart and that would be good. Elevated foreign demand for US beef would be a good thing. Long term, I can say that's there, but near term, the last six or nine months, I can't say that. The recent trend is not good. I hope we see it reverse, okay? So that's one leg of the stool, is the foreign demand one, and that's all we're gonna say on exports unless we have more questions. The second one I wanna highlight, this meat demand monitor project that I house here at K-State. It's funded by beef and pork checkoff. I'm gonna use it, everything's available on our website. If you wanna know more, go there, ask me questions. But it allows me to speak to the two domestic market channels separately, is why I bring it in today. This is a chart, gives me information on ribeye steak demand. Specifically, the blue line is retail demand. Again, think grocery store for at home. And then the black line is food service. So specifically dinner meal is the way we measure this. The project was started in February of 20. And you can see there was nice overall demand growth until here early in 2022. So I made this comment earlier that domestic beef demand was really good the first part of the pandemic. There's a lot of points of evidence on that, not just the survey based effort, but more generally demand for ribeye steak grew over that time. Early in the pandemic, there was the hiccups of demand through restaurants fell when it grew through grocery stores, when I've told you guys that before and so forth, so that bears out here. But what I want you to really recognize at the moment was the overall demand growth until the first or second quarter of 2022. More recently, we've had domestic demand decline in both market channels for ribeye steak. And the same story holds for ground beef. So this charts the exact same mechanism, but now it's ground beef or hamburger meals if it's for uh, food service, because we don't tend to eat it just as a pound, it's part of a, you know, on a patty or something. Um, same story, retail demand jumped, food service declined early in the pandemic. This is steeper, so the amount of growth that we saw going into early into mid-2022 was even more stark, which is good. So ground beef led, if, like, if you like, in many ways. But again, the last several months, we've had a decline both in retail and food service. Please note the food service one, which is this brown one right here, has declined a little bit more. Same thing here on ribeye steak, it's declined a little bit more. That corresponds with foot traffic through restaurants taking a hit. And that corresponds with this nasty slide. It's my opinion that the beef industry has had a period of really good demand and the public is very, the typical person in America, there's minority segments, but the typical person views beef, and by the way, pork and chicken too, the broader proteins, as a favorable part of their diet. But affordability has become an issue. And it's not because of the supply side dynamics in the beef industry, it's because they're having a personal at home financial wallet pinch. And I'll walk through that for a few slides. So this right here is a chart from the Federal Reserve. I include the links here if you ever wanna go get this. Um, in the summer of 2022, our society here in the US had inflation that was unprecedented during my time on this earth. I mentioned earlier, I'm 42 to benchmark that, right? Some of you that are enough older than me lived through some of this earlier, but regardless, it's a fairly recent event for a large share of the US population. 
This gray part right here is the recession from early 20. You can come in, you won't bother me. Come on in. It is two to 4% range, and 3% was sort of the average experienced inflation we had going into the pandemic oriented recession. And then during that point in 2020, when we shut down a lot of our economy in the subsequent months, we briefly had a period of deflation. Things got cheaper, right? So people weren't spending as much. I mean, they were on certain categories, but collectively our economy was not as active. So we actually had inflation come down. But since, let's say, you know, third quarter to make this rounded out of 2020, all the way up here until the summer of 2022, we had this perpetual increase in inflation. So the cost of things you were buying, almost regardless of category, was going up pretty fast. Closer to home, this applies to feed and labor and lots of other things too, but the general resident in our country was facing this 8 9% inflation compared to, say, 3% before. Okay? I've put this green box and question marks here. I have no clue where we're going in the future. We could talk about that if you want in the Q&A. There has more recently been this kind of scare and uncertainty shock on the market. There was some evidence as we got around Christmas that maybe inflation was declining and maybe we turned the corner, but you can see this thing came back up. So it depends what inflation measure I bring to you, exactly how steep that V is and so forth. But there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment on are we gonna go back to 2% and if we are, how long is it gonna to take to get there? It's the best way I know to say that. So that uncertainty is a really big deal. The global exchange rates tied to the US dollar are directly tied to this. The general inflation is directly tied to that. Federal Reserve's policies drive a lot of that. Affordability of US beef on the global market is tied to the exchange rate, if you're tracking me. So this uncertainty is definitely worth watching. Closer to home to understand the consumer and why I think we've had the hiccup in beef demand in the last, say, six months is this pinch. And this isn't me, but it's somebody else, right, that's tightening their belt. And the reason I highlight this is we could have cost of goods go up by 5% every year and if every person's wages went up by exactly 5%, they wouldn't have to change behavior. That's an academic pie in the sky kind of statement. But in the event your wages went up at the exact same rate as cost and there's no hiccups there, your basket of consumption wouldn't have to change. That's the way to think about that. Well, in reality, of course, that's not how it plays out. And before the recession, the most recent one here, this again is Federal Reserve information, real wages were growing. So this line going up meant the, and it's median, so think the middle person in our economy, was actually getting ahead. Their wages were growing more than the cost of the goods they buy. And that was a good story basically until the pandemic. And I don't think the pandemic alone is the reason for this change. That's a broader discussion. But regardless, since the second quarter of 2020, we've had a decline in real wages. So a person's hour of time is not going as far towards what they buy as it once did. And this is a real geeky slide to make that point deeper for the three or four in the room that really like geeky versions of this. Um, one of my colleagues, Jason Lusk, is at Purdue University. He's director, of, he's the department head and director of a couple different centers. They have this center with this dashboard, and you can do a lot of cool stuff with it, but I'm gonna show you one application. And the application I did was I pulled up what's average wages for the median worker, going back to 2010 is what's on the bottom half of this thing, and wages have gone up, so earnings have went up. And then I picked a basket of goods, and because of where we are today, I picked some meat items, right? What's the price that's reported by the government, Bureau of Labor Statistics specifically, for various products? And I've clicked ham, pork chop, bacon, ground beef, beef steaks, and chicken breast as six kind of representative categories that are on here. And I'm gonna give you a specific example of how to interpret this with beef steaks. So in January of 2020, the average worker could work one hour, and if they chose to take their earnings from that one hour of pay and do nothing but buy beef steak, now their spouse probably wouldn't let them do that, but let's just pretend they did that, okay? They would buy 3.7 pounds of beef steak in this exercise. That exact same deal done in December of 2022, they could buy 3.5 pounds of beef steak. So please note, their wages went up, but the asking price on beef steak went up by more. So that's the squeeze, right? So there's a 5% reduction in beef steak affordability for that average worker is the point. The whole meat basket is that way. The actual category varies, right? But these are all red for a reason. And by the way, this is not unique to meat. I could probably have done this with any category, but because I'm sitting in front of you for a beef cattle discussion, we're gonna highlight that. So when I say I think it's not an image problem, it's not a quality problem, there's not a safety issue, that's not what's going on with demand decline. I personally believe it's an affordability of all things in our economy, and consumers are tightening their belt, and they're just watching their budget tighter on many things, okay? I'll put this in if you have interest in these kind of geeky things. The meat demand monitor, um, 
has been going on for three years now, and I'm able to bring a lot of state level insights from it at this point. I'm not gonna belabor this. I'm just kind of doing a commercial. This dashboard is there. Um, I made a comment earlier. I get to work with a lot of good PhD students. Another one I'll name plug is Justin Bina, works with me more on this project. He helped build this dashboard. I have no clue how it works. That's, you have good students around you and they pull it off. But you can, you can pull information out about your state, and in this case, Kansas is the one I'm sitting in. For example, in the fourth quarter of 2022, we find the typical person in our survey consumes beef in one meal yesterday. So one of the three meals yesterday had beef in it, okay? A little bit less than half a meal had pork. So they have a pork meal every other day, if you wanna think about this as the way to interpret that, right? If there's three meals a day, there's six over two days, so you get to one pork meal every two days and so forth. You can use this to benchmark relative frequency and how it differs by state, but that's just a consumption number, a frequency of meals the other day. There's demand information that's down here and so forth. Not all of you want this, so I'm not gonna walk us all through that, but if you wanna know how Kansas differs in California, and we have friends here from California today, which is nice to see, um, this tool can help you understand that. I also bring it in to interject, ribeye steak demand is actually stronger in California than it is Kansas. Ground beef demand is stronger in Kansas than it is California. But if you think through that for a moment, why I'm saying that is there's more folks that are positioned to afford an expensive steak in California than there are Kansas. So even California, even though not everybody in this room agrees with California policies, is an important market for US beef is why I remind us of that. So you can use this tool to get state by state comparisons. I'm just picking on California and Kansas, but you can do it with any state. All right, my take home store summary. Please remember my herd dynamics comment. We're definitely shrinking the herd. Most likely higher cattle prices. All the projections I gave you are consistent with that, but the demand story is mixed. I hope you heard my words of caution, kind of the, the storm clouds that are out there that could pause how high those cattle prices go. I include this because I haven't brought up any of these hot topics, but we may want to deal with them in Q&A, or we may just want to go have lunch. That's up to you guys. Um, we've recently had you know, an atypical BSE event in Brazil that's added some shock in the global beef trade world. There's definitely a broader discussion about US-China relations. There's the ongoing discussion about how many packing plants are we actually going to add, and what does that mean? You know, we've had full talks on that. There's the latest quote unquote Transparency Act a month ago was introduced in the Senate. That's a newer version of past versions of that in the last few years. I'm happy to entertain questions on any of those or anything else. So I'm not dodging them, but most of those are sources of uncertainty and bigger things around the core fundamentals I try to give you. And I'm happy to take questions on any of them if you want. That's my last slide. Thank you. So once again, if you've got a question, uh, we'll bring the mic so they can hear you in the Auditor the arena. Dr. Weber. Thank you, Dr. Tonzer. Um, speak to, if you would, please, um, the, the, the packing plant um, and hook capacity that we, you know, there's been lots of discussion, government funding support subsidies for that, um, going into what appears to be a, at least an intermediate period of decline fed cattle inventory. Seems like a bad time to add hooks to the space, right? Yes, that's <laughs> probably the shortest answer. Uh, but to give the question more credence here, there's still uncertainty about how many plants are actually gonna be built, when they're actually operational, and what the size of them are. I mean, so the uncertainty there isn't as stark as Jason's uncertainties. I mean, I could, I could swag those numbers a little bit better, but some plants are pledged, but there's no concrete in the ground. So one should not just treat them as certain if there's no concrete in the ground, is the point. And definitely not if not all the money's raised yet. So some of those are still just announcements in the fundraising stage. Some of them are being built, right? So there's a long, we could go list by list in different ways. But on aggregate, make no mistake, we are adding physical and hopefully by extension operational capacity. And I think I've done this with this room, but they're not the same. So in the state of Kansas, there's four major facilities that if they're running well, have roughly 6,000 head a day, steering heifer processing capacity. But that's not realized every day. So I always say if a belt breaks and you gotta shut down for a period of time, you don't hit 6,000 that day, right? So humor me for a moment. If you get 5,500 accomplished instead of 6,000, your operational capacity was 5,500. The engineering broiler plate, when it all works well, was 6,000, okay? So we're definitely adding physical capacity. The extent that we're adding operational is a function of not just the total brick and mortar we're putting in, but the technological advancements that are there, how reliant they are on labor, and what labor we have and this gets political real fast, 
But there's a legit question about, it's one thing to build them, it's another thing to run them. So just adding physical capacity itself doesn't give us operationals why I interject that. But even with all that aside, we definitely are adding capacity at a time that we're shrinking the number of animals going through the system. So if and when we pull the, tr not when, because I think we will, but is it going to be 24, is it going to be 25 when we pull the trigger on herd expansion? And then thereafter, how far do we got to wait until we have larger heifer and steer slaughter is really important, not just for the new entrants, but the current incumbents, right? And I think this room understands all that. Um, average margins between packers and feed yards have changed a lot in the last 12 months. Your question is related to that going forward. Um, I've given full talks on this. If you want a longer version of this, in August, I did a thing for KDA, Kansas Department of Ag, on this topic. Uh, it's on YouTube if you want to listen to it. Uh, there's a history lesson in that, and it's a reminder that up until 2016, so pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, frankly, even pre the most recent political arguments in the presidential space, we had more physical capacity to harvest than we had cattle. And that was a statement for multiple decades, pretty much my life until 2016. I was born in 1980, for those of you that follow my 42-year-old statement. It's a fairly recent thing in the history of the industry that we needed shackle space. And we're adding it, right? But there's real market outcomes of doing that, and we're going to live through them in the next few years. That's probably more than you wanted, but go, go listen to the August recording. It's cross-linked on this page, too. It's an August 2022 recording. Yes, Matt. Hey, Dr. Tonzer, um, I think you touched on this I, I know you did and I probably wasn't paying very close attention at that point but shame on you Matt. I know I, I apologize but I think I think even if I wasn't paying attention there's a little more to draw out so you talked about demand for beef softening in uh, fourth quarter of 22 and looks like first quarter of 23 how does that compare to um, um, animal protein demand are we are we shifting to lower priced? Um, uh, but uh, talk about that a little bit or maybe draw that out a little bit more. Yeah, th thank you for the question. Uh, the, the pork demand story is very similar. So there's not clear evidence of a shift towards pork. The chicken pull down isn't as strong and in some cases chicken demand is up. So part of it, but I honestly think it's a minor part, but regardless, part of it is a shift from beef to chicken, which isn't surprising. That's part of why you ask, right? The relative price differences here. But it's not just that, and I want to interject that a little bit longer. Pre-pandemic, and I always timestamp these things because I'm not saying we're in or out of the pandemic, but before March of 2020, there was a lot of evidence for like 20 years that what geeks like me call cross-price effects. So the effect of chicken price on beef demand, the effect on pork chop price on beef demand and so forth, was declining. So what was going on in the pork and chicken space mattered less for beef demand over those 20 years getting closer to the pandemic. I fully believe that. I mean, I'm not the only geek that's estimated that out and so forth. During the pandemic, we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because buying behavior changed so much, there's a lot of mixed messages. There's points in time where people went to the grocery store and they bought all the meat they could find regardless of the species, right? They were just filling the freezer, so to speak. So it messes with that. I'm giving you that longer comment because I personally don't think beef, pork, and chicken are as much of a substitute as a lot of other people do. I think there's fewer people in this country that walk into the grocery store and are sort of indifferent between a beef roast and a pork roast and price alone drives which one they take. I think they have a predetermined recipe or they've only cooked one of the two or whatever, so they're not as comfortable, knowledgeable, or maybe even a, you know, willing to substitute. That's my thesis on that over time. Um, things like TikTok videos and so forth, they never come out with a recipe for a chicken breast and a pork chop and a ribeye steak. It's always specific to one, right? And I'm not picking on TikTok, you get the point. The modern version of that is more cut specific. So I think the cross cut and by extension cross meat substitution isn't as strong as it once was. I still think the broader demand pullback is an affordability thing, not something one species is doing at the expense of another one. We'll get you next, he's got one behind you. So what's avian flu doing to the chicken population or production and where does it play into your plan? So I said nothing about eggs and keep in mind eggs and broiler production aren't the same, right? And I'm not a uh, bird disease expert, so I'll try to stay in my lane. But the majority of the reason for eggs being more expensive is supply disruption because of disease. And there's ongoing discussion about how much of a related disease disruption might we have on broiler production. 
but that's a lot of uncertainty at the moment is how I would tee that up. It's possible that we're going to have more disease issues there that will have the effect of taking chicken off the market. But please notice how I said that, uncertainty and possible. On balance, that hasn't happened much yet. So sitting here today, early March, it's, it's almost exclusively an egg disruption story, not a chicken production story in this here. But on the disease front, it's worth monitoring. And if we're going to have a disease discussion, we also need to recognize African swine fever remains a threat on the pork side. It's closer to home than it was a couple years ago. It's not saying I wish it on the U.S. industry, but we've got to recognize it. And if that happened, it would disrupt pork production in the U.S. And, I mean, just to be complete here, the BSE event, atypical BSE, as I understand it, in Brazil, right, is something that's with our global system we've got to be aware of. So the disease issues are worth monitoring, but sitting here today, there's not a massive chicken production disruption. Hope that helps. Justin right here is, unless, I, unless that was your question, just by chance. Yeah. yeah. I, I live in mixed country uh, as far as crops and the pasture up in Marshall County, and I see it in, in Nemaha and other counties around me. Uh, with land prices as high as they've gotten, I see so many acres of pasture being broke out to grow crops on it, and the government's kind of covering their butts with crop insurance, in my opinion, and I'm not anti-crop insurance, but it ought to be more actuary science is or driven that what they're paying for premiums ought to be covering the losses instead of subsidized so much. So I think the CRP program is causing a lot of grass to be plowed up. And then I think long term that's going to have a big effect on future how cow herds because there's just going to be a lot of less grass to run a mama cow on. And then my second comment is I'm old enough to live through the 80s and 18 half and 21 percent short-term money. It looks to me like interest rates are going to have to go a lot more up to cool inflation. Am I totally wrong? So there's a lot of different comments there. I'm going to leave the politics of what we should or shouldn't subsidize to the side because that's all different debates. Um, your second part was where are we going with interest rates, right? Um, your crystal ball is probably as good as mine there. I am in the camp we have not solved inflation yet, but please notice how I respond to that. There's more than one way to slow inflation. One is to increase interest rates. There's other things you can do to slow an economy. The Federal Reserve has other levers they could pull. I think they're going to continue to bump up rates, to answer your question, but it's not the only thing they can do. There's other ways to take cash off the market. Okay? Um, the, probably the main relevance of that is land values, the net present value tool I alluded to, you got to put a discount rate into there. The net present value that was alluded to in our first presentation, if you plug 6% versus 12% into there, you're discounting future dollars a lot differently. So most of this room understands that. But the realized borrowing rate, if you're going to the bank to borrow something to buy land, or if you're thinking through what discount rate to put on a female, that interest rate decision is much more relevant today than it was two years ago. And not just two years ago, but we had roughly a 10-year period where money was, at least historically speaking, pretty cheap. And we're not there anymore. I share your thesis, it's probably going to get more expensive. I'm not willing to jump to the 18.5 historically, right? But maybe higher than it is today. And the main point to remember when you leave this room is it matters. So you need to know that number, whether you're assessing a carbon credit offer or what you pay here, if you're competing with somebody to buy land, whatever, that has a notable impact on reducing the net present value of something if a future dollar is worth less, is the punchline of that. So, yeah. That's my best response. Other questions? I have one for Justin. Are we having something good for lunch? Yes. Good. Um, I don't actually know your opinion on country of origin labeling, but most economists tend to be against it. And I struggle with that, both from the consumer and producer side. You know, I, I love shrimp with my steak, right? So when I go look for shrimp, first thing I do is flip the bag over. If it's a third world country, I'm not buying it. I'm, I'm not willing to pay more for American. I'm just not going to buy third world country. So I have to think that there are a lot of consumers like me that would, that would drive up the cost for Gulf caught shrimp, right? So those people in the Gulf doing the shrimping makes their shrimp worth more. 
So flip that to my products, right? And I see, you know, consumers go pick out a package of hamburger and it says Australian beef and American beef mixture or American beef. They're going to pick the American beef and pay more for it. So I would think that drives more value to me as, as the producer. Um, and, and I get, when I hear arguments against it, they're saying, well, you know, these countries, if we la make them label their products, they boycott our beef. Well, you know, Australia, Brazil, they're not buying our beef. So, so I, don't, I don't think I care if they boycott our beef. So I, I struggle how it doesn't result in more dollars in my pocket with country of origin labeling. So first, most in the room know I'm a very transparent guy, so I'm gonna start there. Um, I was the lead author, one of three economists, on a report to Congress during the, when we actually had mandatory country of origin in place. So I've lived and breathed it, and I'll tell you what we found, to answer your question, then we'll go further, is our work would say less than a third of the public even knew that we had origin labeling when it was mandatory. We had no evidence of a demand boost from it, and there was lots of evidence that it was costly. Now, there's different ways to quantify how costly, but no, no policy is free, right? So if you have no demand bump, but yet something was costly, no benefit cost ratio on it, that is going to be good, right? That's the punchline. I'm trying to keep it jargon free of our report. It's a 200 page report. It's got a lot of geeky stuff in it. Um, my opinion is the same thing would hold today, that the typical person is not willing to pay more for the difference. Maybe we could implement that policy more cost effectively today than we did last time because of technological advancements, but it still won't be free. So if there's no demand perk and it still costs something, I'm not sure the net conclusion, I'm talking for the whole industry when I say this, I think it's still adverse. So I am in that camp, if you like, as a past researcher and so forth. Um, that's not to say there isn't opportunity for some producers, because I think there's some consumers that do care a lot about it and they want to do something different, right? But that's, I would suggest that's not just an origin thing. Sometimes that gets confounded with local or direct to farmer and a lot of other stuff are part of a broader story. And, and I have zero problem with that, right? I wish both sides, the beef buyer and the beef producer, all the best. That's called capitalism, right? But that's individual business alignment that's all in the voluntary space, both the consumer voluntarily choosing to pay more or not, and suppliers voluntarily choosing to do something or not, or label or not differently. So my general advice for the industry is to keep it that way. And if there's organic growth that that actually matters demand-wise, you'll buy more companies and more pounds into that and that'll resolve it, so to speak. I firmly believe that. If not, and we force it, which is what a law would do of any sort, you're imposing that cost on all pounds because you gotta track everything in order to make a claim. And I think the cost would outweigh what existing demand there was. That's my summary on past work and what I think if you made me redo it today, in March of 23, I'd still conclude. Why hasn't it impacted those industries? I, I concur that labeling differs by category. I don't concur that it's free. And part of that is it's not just the physical put it on there, there's also a liability component. So if I put a label on something, now I, somebody can come after me if the claim isn't right. A little bit related to our first talk, right? You're opening yourself up to different things, right? So I'm not trying to make this a litigation comment, don't take it that way. But anytime you put additional information, in this case, the source of origin, right? you're subject to additional exposure. And therefore, by definition, it's not free. There's a physical component of putting a label on and so forth, which is there too, but that's not the total cost, is the reason I give you that comment. And we live in a litigious society. All right, well, I think that wraps up our morning session. Let's uh, give Dr. Tonzer a round for...